Hey you folks, Quilly Dean here and welcome to another episode of our C Sharp tutorial for complete beginners. Today we're going to be implementing a uh, keyboard input and output for our character and we're going to do that by introducing subclassing. So you've looked at classes. This is a class, for example, called unit. It describes a unit. Now this works for any kind of unit. We are using this both for our player is a unit and our enemy unit, which is a unit, because they all work the same way in the world. They have an X and Y coordinate, they have a symbol that represents them, they know how to draw themselves to the screen. There may be other things later on. For example, I'm thinking that collision will cause things to damage each other, most likely, because it's gonna be sort of a dodging game. If an enemy collides into you, the player takes damage and the enemy probably dies and goes away or something of that effect. So, you know, these units all share certain behaviors, but, there is one very important difference between a player unit and an enemy unit. And a player, well, you need input and output for it. Whereas enemies, they will have some sort of AI. Now, there's many different ways that we can resolve this. For example, let's say, for example, here in our unit class, by the way, I've tweaked the unit class slightly from the last episode. I just went ahead and implemented the Y property in exactly the same way as the X property, um, making sure that it is within our, our, our bounds. Um, and technically over here, I turned unit graphic into a property as well, because I just leave the getter, getter and setter sort of blank and generic over here. We don't need to define anything inside and we don't need to have a private to actually store anything in. Um, effectively, I think I mentioned this before, effectively having a public field is exactly the same as having this kind of property, but it's just a better convention. So you can assume that we have some sort of, let's say we have a function, public void um, update. This is a very common sort of term. So um, this is an instance method that gets run every frame uh, where the unit should um, resolve any gamey things that are going on. In fact, let me, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this and I'm gonna place this above over here, okay? So the idea is, the idea is that all units update, update themselves, then all units will be drawn, okay? So we'll get that sort of thing happening over here. So every unit's gonna run this update every single frame, but the big difference is that a player unit will care about the keyboard input and output to make its decisions, whereas an AI unit will do just that, use some sort of artificial intelligence to affect its behavior. This, we will be implementing that in this, um, in this game, in this example, but it was gonna be very, very simple. So what could we do? Well, we could have, now I haven't talked about Booleans yet, but we could have some sort of Boolean over here that says something like, um, so we could make it public, um, is player. And by default, this could be set to false, but for the player unit, we could set that to true. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do this, by the way. I'm just doing this as an example. We have this Boolean. Boolean is simply a value that can be true or false, like an integer or like a string, but a Boolean can only be true or false. We could have a default to false, but if it's an actual player as opposed to an enemy, we could set it to true. And then in our update, we could say something like, if is player is equal to true, then we can do something, do keyboard, keyboard inputs. Else, do AI. Right? And that's perfectly fine. But there's a couple of situations where if you ever find yourself in, in, in an object-oriented program and you're finding yourself making a massive behavioral change based on a flag, like if is player is true or false, and you're making pretty significant changes one way or the other, that should be a hint that subclassing may be in order. So what is a subclass? Well, um, a subclass is, or a child class, is a class that derives from another. It is, well, I guess the best way to, to explain it is just to give you an example. So we're not going to do this. This is player stuff, so that we have these big if statements, which could be super long. Instead, and this is always the goal in programming as much as possible, keep everything small, tight, and focused as much as possible. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on our Dodge game project over here. We're gonna go to add, new file. We're gonna add a new class and this class is going to be called 
player unit. Okay. So new class over here. And again, the file gets sort of filled out for us. Very handy. The namespace, the class, which is there. And it goes ahead and creates this empty constructor for us, which is redundant. If we're not, if we're literally not going to do anything with this constructor, we can just delete it, which is why Zamarin Studio here uh, grays it out a little bit. And if you mouse over, it says the empty constructor is redundant. It doesn't need to exist, although it doesn't hurt anything one way or the other. That's perfectly fine. Um, so... If we want, so we're going to make this player unit. We want it to follow all the rules of unit by itself. Player unit is a unit, does everything a unit does, uh, has all the properties that a unit has. For example, a player unit will have an X and a Y coordinate, will have a symbol, etc., etc. So what we can do here is after it says the public class player unit, we can put a colon over here and put in the parent class name, in which case it's unit. So what we're saying here is that player unit it derives from the unit class. So um, I know that we're getting an error over here. Why is that? Well, the reason is, it becomes a lot more obvious, I think, if I just go, let me just go and clear this out, and then we get an error over here. The reason is whether we have a, um, a constructor, if we don't have a constructor, C Sharp automatically makes an empty constructor for us, which just looks exactly like this. But we're still getting the error. Here, if you mouse over, it says enemy empty constructor is redundant. That's not quite the right error. If I do a build over here, right? So you go with a build menu, build all, then we get a proper error. Although it might be a little hard to understand. There's no argument given that corresponds to the required formal parameter X, yada, yada, yada. What's going on here? Well, we're saying player unit is a unit. And the only way we can create a unit is with a constructor that follows this signature. Okay, what I'm going to do temporarily is I'm going to go and I'm going to make, I'm going to allow us to make a unit without passing it any parameters. Okay, just we're not going to keep this, it's just going to be so that we can go ahead with this example a little simpler. If I go and compile it now, everything is happy. Let's just ignore this stuff and this stuff for a second, okay? Let's pretend that, that we're not having to deal with that. All we're gonna care about is the fact that a player unit is a unit. So what we can do is we can go back to our game over here and this variable, this player unit variable, instead of instantiating a new unit, I can instantiate, let me just comment this out for a second, a new player unit, like that. Now what's interesting here is that our player unit variable is still defined as being type unit not as being type player unit. And as it turns out, this is perfectly fine. This variable that we happen to call player unit, right? But it could be anything. This could be the variable Bob, right? And variable Bob is expecting it, expecting to hold a unit. And over here, we could put a unit into Bob. It just so happens it's a player unit, but player unit is a unit. So this is completely legal. And then if I rename down here to Bob as well, everything would be happy. And in fact, we'd have exactly the same program as before. So let me just undo the renaming over here. So now we still have player unit. Player unit is still going to be defined as being just a unit for now. But we instantiate a new player unit. But you remember when we instantiate something, it was expecting us to put the X and Y coordinate and the unit graphic that we're going to use, um, which is what that whole complaint is about. Because we still want to be able to do, um, well, this part, I suppose. This part right over here. We still want to be able to do that. And right now we can't because there's no constructor for player unit that follows this pattern. Unit does, right? Let me delete this. Unit has a constructor that follows this pattern, but player unit does not. It only has a constructor that is blank. And in fact, we get a lot of complaints here because we are not calling the correct base constructor for unit. There's a bit of a chain. When you call, when you call um, when you want to create a player unit, it still has to satisfy the base constructor over here, which we could do. What you can do here, and this is looks gonna, gonna look a little bit funny, but I can say this, okay? This is gonna call the base constructor. Base is my base class, which in this case is unit. And I can say, yeah, just uh, create an object um, here. There we go, at zero, zero, put an X down. And then that all of a sudden is not so uh, complaining, except the fact that I put a semicolon there where there shouldn't be. And now if we try this again, oh yeah, not an X, let's do an at symbol, sorry. Or I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna do a dollar sign over here. So now if I compile, we got no errors. Okay, so now in my game, I'm creating a player unit 
using an empty constructor. I'm not passing it any values whatsoever. That is calling this. This is the constructor here that is being run. Because our base class only has one constructor and it needs three values, you cannot create a unit, not even something derived from unit without satisfying this. We can do it this way. We can allow a player to get created by passing no parameters whatsoever, but it will pass some stuff to the base. It's going to set us at zero, zero and declare our symbol to be a dollar sign. If we run this, we will see that's exactly what happens. At zero, zero, we get a dollar sign. All right, I can change this to um, 10, zero. So at 10, zero, we get a dollar sign. That's perfectly fine. Now, this is not particularly useful. Instead, what we really want over here is we want to still require an X, Y, and what do I call it? Unit graphic. I still want to require these three things over here. Um, because I still want, when you create a player, I think you should still have to label all these things. Although maybe you don't have to specify the unit graphic, you know, maybe we could have just assumed something. But then the player unit by himself doesn't really have anything to do with the X and Y and unit graphic. All we care about is passing it to our parent, to our base over here. And it's font's a little bit large, you can't quite see it. So the player unit still is going to itself require three parameters to be passed and then it's going to pass those to the base, and our base is going to take care of that stuff. The player unit class itself doesn't want to deal with this stuff. That's too low level. That That's unit's job. Player unit's going to deal with much higher level stuff. So we just pass it to our parent. So now, if we go back over here and we try to compile, this is no longer legal because you can no longer create a player unit with no parameters. Instead, to create a player unit, you're going to have to pass it three parameters over here. And now if we were to run this, then we're back to where we were at the start of today's video. But the funny thing is this is no longer just a unit. It's a player unit, which means it can have specialized behavior that is not shared by all basic units, such as what? Well, so what we're going to do is we've decided that our unit class is going to have this update routine where the unit's supposed to just update itself and handle all of its bookkeeping and move around and do whatever it's supposed to do. Then we're going to draw itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our run command over here. We're going to say first, oops, first update all of our units. And all we're going to do is call player unit dot update and enemy unit dot update. Then we're going to draw them both. Okay. Now, right now, this unit method, our function over here is blank. So again, if we run this, so every frame this is executing, right? Uh, actually, no, I guess run only runs one time. That's true, I forgot about that, but okay. We're gonna fix that in a second. So when we hit run, the updates will execute, then the draws will execute. So I run this, the updates execute and nothing really happens, and then the draws execute. And then we exit right away. First of all, let's change this to be a loop. I think that's gonna be a lot better. Um, so where do we want to do that? Well, I don't think I want to make the loop inside of main. I think we just want to be able to say game.run. So what we're going to do inside of run, we're going to do a while loop. We looked at that in the second video. A while loop, and I'm going to put in true. While true. So this will run forever because while will execute the following block so long as the condition stays true. And since we're passing true as the condition, then this while will run forever. This is an infinite loop. So if we go ahead and run this with control five, this is now looping infinitely. And I don't know if you can quite tell over here, the uh, cursors are jittering about because it's repeating it over and over and over. And that's okay here. Um, we're going to, we're going to hide the cursor later on. So don't worry about that. Uh, the other thing is this currently, there's a good chance that this is using um, a lot of our CPU. In fact, this loop is basically running as fast as it possibly can. Oh, I don't think it runs when I tab out. No, that's not right. Oh, when I'm tabbed out, it doesn't show the cursor. That's kind of interesting. This is basically running as fast as it possibly can. Um, so we might want to incorporate a delay later on, but let's worry about that later. So it's quickly drawing these two over and over because what is it doing nonstop? In this loop, it's updating both units, drawing both units, and then we restart the loop. Update, draw, restart, update, draw, restart, update, draw, restart. This runs forever, but you can leave by Xing out. 
and this is true by um, on any platform. Not only that, if you do a control C, that will go and interrupt your program right away because this is a command line program. So control C will interrupt no matter what, but just Xing out should also sufficiently kill the program. Um, I'm pretty sure on every platform. So there you go. All right. So why is this in blue? Oh, it's it, It's just letting you know, by the way, this run function will never end. That's okay. We'll, we'll fix that later on. So this loops over and over and over. That's good. But what are we doing in the update right now? Well, right now we're doing nothing, but again, since this update runs for both um, enemies um, and players, it will need need to be overridden by the child classes. So what are we talking about here? Well, it's kind of interesting. Let's one thing to note, and we haven't really addressed this, is the update function, the update method here is running for player unit, but player unit doesn't have an update function. I don't have an update function though. So what is happening when we go player unit.update? Well, it checks to see if player unit has an update function. And if it doesn't, it goes to the parent. So it's running this one for the player. What we would like to do though, is we would like to have another function in here, public void update. We would like this one to be run. When the player update function gets called, we would like to execute, execute this instead of our parent classes update. In other words, we want to override the parent. Is that what's happening now? No, it's not. That's why actually we're in the blue underline here because the Marin's like, whoa, are you sure this is exactly what we want? Something's funny going on here. Let's see exactly how funny. We are going to throw an exception. We already have dealt with that a little bit. Again, I haven't really explained exceptions, but throwing an exception will cause our program to crash and yell and whine and freak out. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say throw new exception. We are in player unit update. This is just a temporary thing, so we know what's happening. So what's going to happen when we run this program? What's going to happen when this line executes? Let's find out. We're going to go run, start. If we're throwing an exception, this program should crash. We are not throwing an exception. The program's not crashing because we're not throwing an exception, which means this code is never running. What is running? Well, let's take a look over here. Our update function. We are in unit update. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to comment out enemy unit over here. So only one update is going to run. Player unit .update. We're going to run this and we get an error that says we are in unit update. But we're calling player unit .update. Why is it running this one instead of this one? The reason is this player unit variable only knows that it is a unit. It doesn't know that it's a player unit. If we change this around and we specified that this was a player unit and then run this again, now we get an error that says we are in player unit update. So by changing the variable type, player unit dot update, this function calls a different function right now because it knows explicitly that it's player unit, it runs this one. But before all it knew was that it was a unit of some kind. So it was running this one over here. Now, you might think, oh, that's fine. We'll just make it a player unit. That's okay. What we're looking to do, though, is as we move forward here, and next episode, we're going to set up an array to hold all these units, especially the enemy units. We don't want to have to memorize which is which. In particular, what if we end up with different unit type, enemy units, right? And an enemy unit will have a different AI, which happens in the update. We're, we haven't looked at that yet. But let's assume that we're going to have many different types of enemies. Some run directly towards you, some wiggle back and forth, etc., etc. These are all enemy units that are derived from unit, and we don't want to remember each one. We don't want to have to create like a bunch of these guys. 
we're going to create an array. You don't know arrays yet, but we're going to create an array that holds something like 20 enemy units simultaneously. And all our program is going to know is that these are 20 units. It doesn't know if it's a wibbly wobbly enemy unit, or if it's a straight line enemy unit, or if it's a running away enemy unit. It doesn't know what kind of enemy subclass we're using, just that it's some kind of unit. So what we want is we would like it so that when we call the whatever dot update, it calls the correct one for the child class without have us having to track which class is which. And you can do this with something called a virtual function. Now, I'm glossing over a ton of sort of background information about how this is handled internally, um, mostly because this is giving you just enough that hopefully you will be able to understand when we are using this in future tutorials in Unity or you're following someone else's example. But in our unit class, not player unit, but unit, our update function, we're going to say that it is virtual. What this does is it indicates to C-sharp that C-sharp is going to do a little bit more babysitting or homework. Every time something dot update gets called, it's going to check an extra table of information to figure out which update should be called. And then in our child, we're going to say our update function here, this overrides our parents virtual function. This is an override function. It overrides a virtual function. So now what's going to happen? We are going to call player unit dot update over here, this variable. But again, this is our Bob, right? Bob, Bob, and we're calling Bob dot update. Well, Bob over here is just a unit. All it knows is that it's a unit of some kind. It doesn't know that it's a player unit. We instantiate it here, but then we just stuff it into a variable type of unit. So when it's calling player unit dot update, we don't know that it's actually supposed to be an actual instance of class player unit. And yet it's going to run the correct one over here. So let's give this a try. I'm going to run this. Of course, we're going to get a crash, but most importantly, we get this crash that says we are in player unit update. That's fantastic. So what what's happening here is it's going to correctly run the right one. And for enemy unit over here, because it's just a generic unit type, or more importantly, it's not instantiated from a class that's got its own custom update, it's going to run that one. Let's give that a try, actually. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to remove the crash from the regular player's update. I'm going to create a new class. So I'm going to add a new file, empty class. I'm going to call this one enemy unit. This is going to be a generic enemy unit. Yeah. Um, this is just a generic enemy unit that moves from the uh, right side of the screen to the left and then disappears. That's its job. Um, and what we're going to do to define that, well, same as before, we need a constructor, and specifically, since this is going to be derived from unit, it's going to need, see how we get the red end line right away? It needs to make sure to call the base constructor, passing it an X, a Y, and a unit graphic. So again, I guess we're going to do the same thing as the player unit over here, basically. We're just going to copy this line and then rename that. So again, we're going to require that enemy unit gets instantiated with an X, Y, and unit graphic, and we're just going to pass that to the base class. Now, what I'm going to do here is enemy unit is not going to have its own update function. That's totally allowed. Let's go over here to our game. Here, you're going to be an enemy unit. Now, if I comment this out, oops, we're no longer going to get a crash because player.unit.update will call this update which doesn't have a an exception throwing there. Uh, oops. New enemy unit. There we go. And I ran the wrong thing, so it's small. There we go. So player unit dot update is running, which doesn't throw an error. And right now I don't have any other updates running because it's um, I commented out. So I'm going to uncomment this. And what's going to happen? Well, enemy unit here doesn't have an update function at all. So it's going to go up to its parents, the unit over here and try to run that. And then we get the lovely error that says we are in unit update. Whereas instead, if I go to enemy unit over here, 
and I say override public void update. Oops. Oh, it's auto completing some stuff for me, which I will explain in a moment. Right? Do AI here. Don't need a capital H. There we go. Do AI here, and we run this. No errors, because now we're running the player units update and the enemy units update. And so then you may be wondering, okay, but then that means unit update never gets run again. And that might be fine. Maybe you don't need to ever call this base one, but maybe it does important stuff. Maybe over here we do something that's useful. And you always, you, for all your units, you're going to be like, well, okay, it's fine that, you know, we do enemy unit here, or AI here. Um, now that the AI calculation is done, let's um, call our base classes um, update function in case it has any important work to do. And what we do is we'd call base update. Base just goes up the chain by one step and then runs that update. And what we could do is we could take this, go over to player unit, and say now that um, our keyboard input is done, let's call the base classes update function in case it has any important work to do. So now if we run this program, we'll once again crash because we still throw an exception here. There we go, and it does. And if we look back, where is it crashing? Well, game.cs line 25 is calling player unit dot update and on line 21 of that it's calling unit dot update which is where we're crashing quite intentionally because we're throwing an exception that's cool now i'm gonna you know get rid of that because i don't want our program to crash and now everything's working again player player unit dot update is running followed by unit dot update enemy unit dot update is running followed by unit dot update we're going to do some important things with this later on i will just point out one more thing with this setup, it is entirely conceivable that you will find yourself in a position where you'll never want to instantiate unit by itself. It doesn't make it, it may not make sense in your program for there to be such a thing as just unit. It always has to be player unit or enemy unit or I don't know, neutral unit or like a, a, a box unit, you know, like inventory that you can pick up, a power up unit, you know, depending on how you implement it. You could find yourself in a position where you'll never ever want unit by itself to be instantiated, in which case what you can do is you can ma mark a, cra a class as abstract. If you mark a class as abstract, it itself can never ever be instantiated. I just compiled now, this makes no difference in our program, everything still runs perfectly the same, but if we were to try to do unit some other unit equals new unit zero zero oops a arg come on a like this okay and i try to run this i can't you're not allowed to just create a unit by itself but it's worth noting that player unit and enemy unit here these variables are just of type unit they are of a type that we can never create by itself you can only create this the children version of it over here and you know what? I'm going to leave that in because I think that's quite cool. Um, what you can also do, if you're doing something like that, maybe, maybe this, uh, for example, um, this update, well, maybe a generic unit never has anything that makes sense to run as an update. So instead, what you could do is you could say that this variable is abstract or this function is abstract. We don't fill it in, but you'd at this point force your child classes to provide their own override of update. You would say, you're, my children, you need to have a method called update. If you don't, you're not going to be legal. So then you could force them to do that. In this case, I think I'm quite happy just undoing and leaving this quite like that. But I'm going to leave the abstract for the class. You can't create a unit by itself. We're just going to declare that. Boom. Done. Excellent. Okay, we're gonna, we need to wrap this up in a minute, but I promised we would get some input and output in here. So that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Our player unit in our update function. How are we going to do that? Um, has the user pressed a key? If so, let's move based on that key input. So we have played around with the console class in the past, which in fact is still 
how we are drawing to the console, to the screen. We're doing console.setCursorPosition and console.write. Console also has the ability to read information. We've looked at, you know, read line, for example. Um, I think we did. Yes, 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 in our number guessing game. Well, we are going to use that again. Well, not read line, because what we want to do is say, first of all, we're not going to wait for a keyboard input. That's what we were doing before. We were waiting until the user hit a key. Now we want to say, has the user hit a key? Because if they haven't, we just want to go on with their life. We don't want to freeze the game until someone pushes something, which is how we were working before. That would be, that would be crap. So how do we do that? Well, we can say if console dot key available is equal to true. If there's a key available, that means the user has hit something. We haven't done anything with it yet, but there's a key that was pressed. So if key con if console dot key available is equal to true, then we can do something. We, we can test this really easy. Throw new exception key. Okay, let's run this. So I'm going to run it. Nothing is happening. You see how like the program is clearly looping over and over and over and over again. As soon as I hit a key, that key available is going to return true. And then we're going to crash, which is perfect. But you see, you know, key. Excellent. That's perfect. So we've got that going on. So that way the game keeps running and doesn't wait for us to hit a, hit a key at all. So, but if we did hit a key, we want to do something with it. So what key got hit? Well, there's two different ways to read that in. Well, there's probably more ways than that, but console.read. So you have, see there's read, there's read key, and there's read line. Read line will read in characters until the user hits enter. So let's, for example, let's do this. This read line returns a string like this with some sort of value. Um, and then we could do something like, oh, throw, throw new exception. Let's just make it like just crazy explicit. There we are. So if we run this again, it's looping infinitely. And as soon as I start typing, well, it's showing up on screen because of reasons. And as soon as I hit enter, so right now we are in the read line. Nothing else is happening. As soon as I hit enter, the read line is going to return this string, which we will then immediately throw as an exception. Okay. So that whole time we were in read line, nothing was happening. Read line is not what we're, what we're looking for. We don't want to wait for the user to type something and then hit enter. That's crazy. Instead, we've got two other options. There's not read. Read returns. Okay. Technically it's an integer, which is a little bit odd. Um, Unicode character thingy. Um, and I mean, we could, we could throw that as an exception. Um, if we convert this to a string, which we can do with two string, we're not using this, but, um, if I run this program, what's going to happen? It's still going to loop until I hit a key. I'm going to hit H. So we've hit, I have hit H. But I still have to hit enter. That doesn't seem right. I didn't what? No. Read the next character from the standard input string. Really? I mean, this is not one we're using anyway, but I thought this returned right away, but I guess that's the whole reason you would use. So this is just going to return the next character as a number, which is weird and inexplicable. What, what this, so I guess console.read doesn't stop, doesn't um, stop um, blocking the program until enter is hit, but this will just read return the next key in the sequence. Returns it as an integer, which is the internal number representation of, in this case, an A, which is 97. Anyway, enough said, this is not what we want to use at all. What we're interested in instead is console.read key. What read key does is it immediately returns as soon as one key is hit and it doesn't wait for you to hit enter or return or anything like that. The weird thing is, is it doesn't return, say, a character. It doesn't return a string. Instead, it returns a console key info. This is a class that holds information about what console key was hit. So we're going to call this temporary variable CKI. So we're going to grab console read key. We're going to stuff it in CKI. And then I'm still going to throw an exception. What are we going to throw? I think we're going to throw CKI dot. It's got a bunch of things in here. We're going to get the key car. I think that's going to be useful. 
Okay, ckei.keycar, we're gonna convert it to a string and I output that. So we're gonna run this, it's running like crazy. I'm gonna hit F, boom. The F went in and instantly returned. So as soon as I pushed F, this console.keyAvailable became true. So because this is equal to true, this block uh, starts to run. See, uh, console.readKey reads the next key on the console and instantly returns. If there was nothing waiting, for example, if we take this and if I put it outside over here, I'm just going to close this. When we run the program, there's not going to be a key waiting for us. So if I run this, it freezes right away until I hit a key and then it stops blinking. Then I got to sort of keep hitting a key to run one frame at a time because what it's doing here is every time you do this, it waits until there's a key in the input buffer. But in this case, because we wrap it in, wrap it in this console.key available, we don't try to read a key from the input buffer until there's one actually waiting for us. This way, our program never blocks. It's running at super speed. And then as soon as I hit a key, boom, it returns that, and then we throw it as an exception with F, and it confirms the key press. So that's great. That's, uh, that's the sort of real timiness that we're looking for. Just as soon as there's a key press, we want to know what it is instantly. Now, what we don't want to do is throw an exception here. What do we want to do? Well, let's make it so that if we hit the up arrow, we move upwards. And because we're PC gamers, not only will we handle the up arrow, we'll also handle WASD, right? That's your standard first person shooter. W is up, S is down, A is left, D is right. So let's start with the letter because it's going to be kind of easy to explain here. If CKI dot key character, which we just looked at, is equal to W, we want to move upwards. Well, first, how would you say if it's equal to W? You might think, well, I've sort of written things before. I'm going to do this. But you see, there's going to be an error here. It's not happy about something. What's going on? Well, this W in our double quotes is a string, right? The same thing as like our string that before was like, hello world or, or something of that nature. Okay, that's a string. A string is a series of characters written one after another and terminated by a special character, which we're gonna ignore. But a string is made up of multiple characters. Keycar is a single character, which is a different data type. Specifically, instead of being string, S is equal to hello world, we have a character C, which is equal to that, single quotes. A single quote represents a single character. You can't do this. This is an error because this has to be a single character like that. Character C holds a single character W. And by the way, this is why when I, I'm uh, doing Pokemon stuff, I always mispronounce things because to me, it's Carmander because car is how you tend to pronounce character. Anyway, so the, these are two completely separate data types. To you as you know, an English speaker or something like that, you are going to be thinking that these are very tightly related or very similar. And while there's some interplay, a string is a series of characters. A character is a standalone thing. In fact, what's kind of interesting, when you have a string, you can, oops, you can say our character C is equal to the first character from the string S. Now, you don't necessarily know this notation yet. This is an, like sort of an array offset, yada, yada, yada. But what we're grabbing here is we're grabbing the zeroth character from this string. And much like our x, y coordinates, strings and arrays, which we'll learn about soon, start at zero. So this is gonna grab the zeroth character from the string, which is H. So now C contains H and we can confirm that. Um, let me just kill this for a second here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw a new exception. We wanna know what C is. Uh, we have to convert this to a string because except new exception requires us to pass it a string and C is not a string. C is a single character, but there's a handy dandy little helper here that will convert the character C into a string. So we've got a string S that contains hello world. We've got a character C that contains the first character from the string hello world. So then it's going to throw an exception. So we're going to run this. Nothing's going to happen until I hit a key because we're still wrapped in uh, this if console equal key available. No, no matter what key I'm going to hit now, I'm going to hit the um, I'm going to hit the M key. So you can see here the M that I just typed. But more importantly, the system.exception that got thrown is a capital H. 
which is the first letter from the string hello world. Anyway, data types. Moving on. So, CKI, if CKI dot key character, oops, CKI dot key character is equal to single quote W, W is up. How do we move up? Well, we have a Y coordinate. Y is our uppy downiness. Um, and the topmost row is Y equals zero. Whereas our bottommost row, it'll depend on the window size, but usually it's going to be Y equals 23. So if we want to move up, we want to make Y one smaller. So how do we do that? Well, Y is equal to the current value of Y minus one. So we're going to run this. So this is our character here. I'm going to hit W. We are moving our character up. Now you'll notice it's not cleaning up our old mess before. Why is that? Well, we wrote an at symbol here, then we wrote an at symbol here, then we wrote one here, and then we wrote one here. We never deleted the old symbol. We're gonna have to deal with that later on. But every time I hit W, we move upwards. That's great, I'm gonna keep going. Oh, that's very exciting, I'm gonna hit one more time. Whoa, what happened now? Well, remember in our unit set Y function, well, our, 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 our set property for the Y um, property, has an exception. We check to make sure that y is valid. It wasn't valid because we were at y is equal to zero and then we went and we hit up one more time setting our y to negative one which is off the screen and we are correctly checking for that and throwing an exception. Good to fail as loudly as possible. So we're gonna have to do something about that. Make sure the player doesn't go out of bounds. But not only that I want to point out another thing. So w moves us upwards. That's great. If I'm for some reason holding shift, or let's say I put caps lock on. I don't have caps lock on. I'm not going to hit W. Nothing's happening. Why? Because this is a capital W. Lowercase W, so I'm turning off caps lock. Lowercase W works. Uppercase W does not. And the reason is, to a computer, lowercase W and uppercase W are completely different things. So how could we catch both of those? Well, there's two ways. Well, there's probably lots of ways, but there's two ways. So instead here we could say, if ckia.key character is equal to lowercase w, or, that is the boolean or operator, or, oops, turn off the caps lock, or ckia.key uh, character is equal to uppercase w, then we do this. So now if we run, I can do, this is lowercase w, that works, and I'm going to do uppercase w, as you can see here, that also works. Ah, oh, that's great. There's another way we can do it, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But what I'm quite interested in is right now, every time I hit a key, it's writing out. And the reason it's doing that is because this happens to be the position of the cursor when I hit the W key. And by default, when you type, it shows up on the screen. We don't want it to show up on the screen. This is We're making a video game. We don't want whatever key the user hits, even including if it's a weird key like 8, K, L. We don't want that to show up on the screen. How do we turn that off? Well, read key and only read key of all the read functions can take no parameter or it can take an, a parameter called intercept. If intercept is set to true, it intercepts the normal console behavior, which is to print the key on the screen. And so if this is set to true, it will no longer print the key to the screen. We can see that. I'm Look down here. I'm gonna hit K, L. I'm gonna hit a bunch of stuff. Nothing is getting printed here anymore. I'm gonna hit W. Okay, we're still moving up. That's good. We're still not cleaning up the old at symbols, but there you have it. And again, if we go off the screen, we get an error, but that's okay. So, all right, we've got the, the W behavior over here, but how else can you move upwards? Well, you can also move upwards. We want to be able to support the arrow key. Great. Okay. So we're going to say, if the key character is lowercase w, or it's uppercase w, or it's equal to... Um, up arrow, how, what, what, how, how do you type an up arrow character over here? Obviously, if I just hit the up arrow in my editor, it moves my cursor up. How do I say I want to respond to that? Well, you can't really. No, let's just say you can't really. There's no, you can't type the character for up arrow. So how do you get that to work? Well, that's why you have a console key character. If you were just ever messing with single characters, you would think that read key would simply return a character called C just like how console.read returns, well, it's an integer, but let's pretend it's a character, right? Why doesn't it return a character? Well, because the console key info holds more information than you might think. In particular, 
CKI dot, instead of key car, you can say key. And what key is, this is not C sharp, right? C sharp, that as a language, has things like integers, floating point numbers, strings, characters, that's all C sharp. But the console class and the console key info class has support for reading the keyboard at a slightly lower level than usual. And ckio.key returns a, this is an, an enumerable, we're not gonna really talk about that, an enum. Um, this returns a speci specific special type of value here that tells you which physical key on the keyboard was pressed, which is completely different from a character, right? So again, lowercase w, uppercase w. Uppercase w is actually the w key while you hold shift or if caps lock is turned on, right? But what key was actually pressed on the keyboard? These two, while they're both different characters, they both are actually the same key on the keyboard. And that's what CKA.key does. We can say if that is equal to console key dot W. So it's very important to note, this is not a character. This is a hardware key. If the hardware key W was pressed, regardless whether you're hitting shift, control, caps lock, alt, any of those things, if the actual physical key on your keyboard labeled W was pushed, this will return to true. So now all of a sudden this works whether I do, this is a lowercase W or an uppercase W. Doesn't matter which one I hit, the physical key on the keyboard labeled W was hit, therefore we do this. And we're gonna use the exact same thing to say, or ckii.key CKI is equal to console key dot up arrow. This is if the key, the key on your keyboard, the hardware key with the little up arrow on it, if that key, which internally is represented by, you know, some sort of internal number and, you know, there's wires that are being hit and different things like that. If that key was physically pushed down, then this returns to true. So now all of a sudden, I'm gonna hit the up arrow and we're moving up. W, there you go. Whether I'm hitting up arrow or W, it works and then it still crashes if we go off the screen. That's okay, we're okay with that. Very, very cool. And then we could do the same thing for the other directions, which we're gonna do quite quickly here. Um, we're gonna say, uh, well, yes, let me do it this way first. So if this key was hit, we go up. Um, I'm copy and pasting here. Every time you copy and paste, a little little light in your head should be going on of like, is this what we wanna do? Copy and paste doesn't sound like fun, but let's move on. So we've got that and we can say, okay, so if the up key was done, then we move up. If the downwards key, which will be the S key or the down arrow, if that was hit, then we will move down. Now you could do an else if here, right? If this was, if this key was hit, do this. Otherwise, if this key was hit, do this. But I don't think you need the else here. Because in a sense, if the user hit both the up key and the down key simultaneously, you'd sort of want these two things to cancel each other out. So it's kind of okay to do it this way. So we've got that and we could copy it again. And we can say, so let's do left. So if we're hitting A or the left arrow, then it's the X and X is negative Y, or your left is negative Y. I guess I should get rid of these comments here because they don't really make sense. Um, and then to go right, it's D and right arrow and positive X is there. Sorry, I think I said wrong letters, but if we're going to the right, it's D, right arrow, and that's X plus one. So now all of a sudden we should be going in all directions. So I'm gonna go to the right, down, left, up, Hey, very cool. I mean, we're still not, you know, getting rid of the old thing, but that's okay. And also hit, hold the key down. And internally, the way that's handled is after a moment, then um, the key press repeats. That's part of, you know, Windows or Linux and, and Mac and all those things. You can see if I go out of bounds, we still get a crash, but you know, things are starting to get a little bit more interesting. Now, when I said, when you see copy and pasting like this, that should set up a, right, uh, a red flag. Also, if ever you're doing a bunch of if statements, that are based on the same values over and over and over again, that should actually also be a bit of a flag in that you could probably replace this with a switch statement. What's a switch statement? Well, I'm gonna delete this. A switch statement takes in a variable, a value that we're gonna make a switch, like, like a railroad switch. We are gonna do a switch based on the 
value of cki.key. And we're going to say, in the case that cki.key is equal to up arrow, then we put in a colon, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to set our uh, y to be equal to our y minus 1. In the case that the console key is equal to down arrow, we're going to set our y to be equal to our y plus 1. Now, if I try to compile this right now, I will get a horrible error. Cannot fall through one case label, blah, 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 blah. What's happening here? Well, let me put a break statement. I'm going to fix it, and then I'm going to explain why this fixes it. I'm going to do that. I'll put another one here, although we don't technically need it, I don't think. Now I compile, and it's fine. If I try to run this, I can go up, and I can go down. Excellent. And we can put in the other arrows now. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. There will be copy and paste here, but I think we've reduced this as much as we can. Left arrow, right arrow, and our left is when we are going negative x and our right is when we go positive x so now again if i run this i can go right up left down that works great but i don't have my w's right i don't have my wasds in place and i would really like to have wasd back in place so what i could do so our up arrow here right that's when we go up i could do another case here whoops there i go let me fix that for the w key so this is also up so up arrow go up, W key, go up. And if I test, I'm hitting W, I'm hitting up. They both work, but they both do exactly the same thing, right? And again, we've got, I've got some duplication. Can we remove that? Yeah. You remember that weird error here? When I do this and I try to compile, it says cannot fall through from one case label to another. Well, what break does, break tells you to sort of stop, stop running this block at this point, right? If, if the key is equal to arrow, then we run this, and then we break, we stop. And it just pops us down here, right? After break, we end up here. That's what happens, it breaks out of this. Well, what we can do is normally, if I don't have this break, in old school sort of C and C++, what would happen is it would do this, then it would do this. In fact, I've had no break statements whatsoever. It would just keep falling through is the term. It would do this, then that, then that, then that, then that. Which I know it seems a little bit weird because this is a very, very old fashioned construct, but you can use it. C sharp does not allow you to fail to break at this point, unless it's completely empty. If I were to remove this line, now there's no more errors. If I hit F8 or, or Control Command B, whatever you want to rebuild all, now there's no errors. What we're looking at here is ckio.key, if it's equal to up arrow or w, so this case or this case, or I don't know, um, oops, uh, we could do case console key dot numpad, what's up? Numpad 8. There you go. Numpad 8. So now you can do up arrow w or numpad 8. That sends us upwards. Same thing here, we can go case console key dot, uh, this is down, so that's S, or case console key uh, numpad, what's down? Two, two over here, there we go. So if any of these are true, it does this, then it stops. If any of these are true, it does this, and then it stops. Uh, and I guess I can do that again. I will do another, an actual copy and paste here. So there and there, except this is left, which is a, and that's numpad 4, and this is to the right, which is D, and numpad 6. There we go. So this is the switch case statement. It doesn't get used that often, because it ra ra as opposed to an if statement, which can check a bunch of things within one conditional, a switch only switches on a single value, right? Here we're switching on ckia.key, that's it. But in that case, it's a very, very compact way to write a whole lot of these. And there's room for internal optimization, uh, which a big if-else change. Because here what we do is you could have, especially as we add more and more key presses over here, you could have if this, else if this, else if this, else if this, else if this. And with those, the computer has to process those statements one at a time. I mean, it's pretty fast at doing that, but depending on how things are set up, that could end up starting to slow down quite a bit. Whereas this switch case statement, the compiler can do various internal optimizations, which are very cool. It hardly matters. But honestly, 
do not concern yourself with processing time at this point in programming. Concern yourself with your personal time first. And in practice, this is a lot easier to maintain than that big clunky if statement, as long as you're only doing a switch on a single thing. Kind of nice. Anyway, we've got that in there. This I've been talking for almost an hour now. We gotta go ahead and put a cut in here, but we're back. We can use the arrow keys. I can use WASD. That's more like making a snake game all of a sudden. Or I can use the numpad. There's six, eight, four, and two. That works out splendidly. Excellent. Very excited about that. Um, so next episode, what we're going to do is we're going to keep looking at some of our little class uh, manipulation here, mostly that we're going to start implementing AI for our enemy. Well, I don't know if that's literally going to be next. I think what we have to deal with next, and this is not really a learn C sharp thing, but more of a let's think about our program flow thing. How do we fix these at symbols so we only have one? How are we going to fix this blinking cursor? Well, I'm going to tell you the blinking cursor thing right away, actually. Um, we're going to go back to our main program here. Before we even start running the game, um, let's hide the blinking cursor. We won't need it. I'm going to say console dot uh, cursor visible. It's a property. We can set that to false. Now, no more blinking cur cursor. We're still not redrawing things and for that, or, or blanking things out. And for that, we definitely have to give it a little bit of think as to how we want to solve that. In fact, you, the X will, oh, X, X won't disappear because, and now they're fighting, um, because the X is overriding that spot. So give it some think. This has been a big double-sized episode, but I think we've covered a lot of really great stuff in there. Learned about classes and inheritance, learned about the switch statement, and we also learned to interact with the keyboard a little bit. And again, interacting with the keyboard, these keyboard functions are only going to be keyboard functions you're going to deal with when you're working in a console application like this. Input and output in something like Unity is handled differently, and input output handled in a different environment that also uses C-sharp is handled differently. Maybe you're making a windowed program, you know, windowed whether you're working in Windows or not, I don't know. Um, if you're working in um, in Zamarin here, you can you have access to GTK, which is a um, a windowing system for opening windows and dialog boxes and making buttons and whatnot. Um, that is cr cross platform Windows, Mac, Linux, perfectly fine. Um, so you know, but handling input and output there is different. You're not going to use the console.read key. You're going to use some other way of reading input. Um, but the sort of logic flow and thinking about it is something that you kind of will apply regardless of what library you're using, right? There's sort of mechanics and constructions and, and whatnot. So anyway, we're going to go and that's what we're going to look at. And mostly we're going to mess around with our drawing. Now, there's a very easy way that we can do it. For example, when running over here, clear the old screen. Console.clear. Actually, that's probably all we'll do maybe. You know what, now that I think about it, well, no. Because it's blinking. Why is it blinking like that? Because first it blanks the whole screen out and then it draws. And there's this tiny moment. I don't even know if it's showing up properly on YouTube. There's this tiny moment in between the clear and redrawing the character. And so now, yeah, we don't get left with the old garbage, but we're going to get an awful headache playing here. So this is not going to be acceptable. So we're going to have to find a better way. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time.